This is the story of how I got a 90 plus game review against an international master. You know how tough it is to be an international master? Very tough, okay? Especially here, the ending was crazy to this game, so stay tuned to the end, there's a nice little surprise there. I had the white pieces against the black pieces, who was an international master from Colombia, 2250 FIDE rated on the FIDE site, it'll be on the screen. Okay, so we start off with my typical e4, book move, so far so good, knight f3, here we're jumping into a Sicilian, d6, d4, takes and takes. So far so good, very typical Sicilian structures. Knight f6 attacking my pawn, very classic, knight c3 and knight c6. This is the definitive move that makes me know that we're going into a dragon. Why? Because if it was a6, this would typically be a Nadorf. And so knight c5, I play my typical bishop e3. Okay, I kind of forgot that you have to play f3 first here. The reason why is that the order of their moves was kind of funky to me. You gotta play f3 first to avoid what happened in the game. So here I played bishop e3 directly and now they have knight g4. The reason is the bishop defends here, which in certain cases it cannot happen and I have some counterplay with bishop e5 check. The bishop would go to d7 and we take the free knight on g4 because the bishop is pinned, etc. Right, but here it works. And so now I go bishop b5, now striking this knight on c6. And after knight takes e3, attacking my queen, I do a counter threat. Knight takes c6, attacking theirs. And once takes, I take, with check actually, <laughs> king takes, and now rook takes d1. And in this position, black has a small edge. Just because, actually they're, they're not developed, I am, and I have a rook staring down a semi-open file, but the black pieces are advantageous because they have the bishop pair and they have a nicer semi-open file on the C file, which will be used in this game, we'll see. A6, kicking my bishop, and now E6. E6 is a very important move. In this position, I wish to do E5, to take, say black plays or whatever move, okay? I go E5, and here they can't push away, they can't take, and ultimately they'll have to let me take on d6, now creating an isolated pawn. What e6 does is that if I do e5 now, they have d5, and now look at this beautiful structure, and ultimately I am countered. So I go f4, taking space, b5, and now castles. I want to open up this f file. You'll see later how I do it. Now we have a rook staring down this half open file and we have a rook on this f file, well placed. Bishop b7, very nice, looking onto my pawn chain and threatening a little cheeky b4, removing the defender and willing to take the center pawn. Something I'm not willing to let go, I go for the aggressive e5. My idea here is that I wanted black to respond with d5 here and close out their light squared bishop. In fact, their bishop looks like it's in a sort of dome here on b7, and that's what I want. You ultimately want to make your opponent's pieces worse. That's what I would accomplish. For the fact, though, that this bishop would be glorious, but we don't talk about that. Instead, my opponent played king c7, to which here I played a special move. It's kind of dubious, but it has its perks. Here I am sacrificing a pawn to absolutely, like going for the principles I want in this position, open the file and invade on the seventh rank. And this is absolutely what I do. Here, as you can recognize, the e6 pawn cannot do anything to not open up this f file. If you take on f5, I'll take here on f5 and I'm threatening f7, very tough to defend that pawn. If you do what happened in the game, take my pawn, I'll take on e6, bishop check, king h1, and then you have double isolated pawns, which is pretty good for me if you have a pawn up best case scenario, and now I have rook f7. And actually, props to the engine, giving me two great moves kind of in a row there. And in this game, I had nine great moves, which is kind of cool. You'll see nine blue moves here. So rook f7, check, and now I invade on the seventh rank. Pretty beautiful rook. This is a very well-known concept of invading on the seventh rank. Very, very good to activate your rooks deep within your opponent's position. It's a very good technique. I highly recommend it. King b6, and now we take on g7. This is actually a small mistake. I missed a very cool move here that is a4. You saw it pointed out by the engine. a4 has the little cheeky goal of threatening a5 here. Say, say, say a random move. We go a5 check. 
And here, if you take, you are actually deflected off of this bishop, and I would win this bishop. If you go to c6, whoop de doo you're in a skewer, right? And, oh, this is actually checkmate. <laughs> Ouch. And if you go king a7, well, bad news for you. Bishop f3 still attacking this bishop twice. Rook a b8, and now I can triple the force on this bishop on b7, and the piece is lost, and much more than that. It's going to be a windmill of discovered checks after that. It's not looking good, Rev. And again, king c6, we have these things. King b7, and it's looking pretty matey here. This looks like checkmate. And if you take my knight, this looks like checkmate. So yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a thing here. I did a bad move, rook takes g7, and this is a good lesson about greediness. In this position, I took back the pawn that I thought was rightfully mine, and gave my opponent some really good counterplay. They didn't play on it, I don't know why. Here they have astounding counterplay, rook a g8, ultimately threatening what's behind my rook, this weak g2 pawn. So I pretty much got a take. I mean, if I go away, you have checkmate in one, so that's not really a choice. And if, when I take, it's, look at the aesthetic of these two bishops and their rook combining, pretty much forcing bishop f3 if I don't wanna get checkmated. Bishop takes, g takes, and now bishop d4. And look at this super annoying bishop. Actually, this does happen in the game. And here, if I wanna do f4 or things like that to disconnect this pawn from this bishop, the bishop would take on c3. Doubling and isolating my pawns, very nice. And now enabling the takes on f4. And look at these beautiful, past, protected pawns for the black pieces. This is completely winning. But my opponent didn't play this. Instead, they played bishop d4. Still the same annoying move I took here. The reason why I took here, and it's a miss. I don't know why it's a miss. What do you want me to play? They wanted me to play a4 again. Okay. The reason why this is... I played this is because I wanted to simply take out the bishop pair that black had. Even though it takes off my rook that was on the seventh rank, even though, you know, I take out my good bishop that was here to stop these double isolated pawns, in this position, I am more comfortable to go for the draw, even with a pawn down because of these isolated pawns. And that's why I choose to do this. Now, this is a little bit annoying. And I realized that in the game. There's not much I can do about it. What I do do here is rook f1. I really like this move, even though, okay, chess.com says it's inaccurate. They want me to give a pawn on b2, bishop b2, and then g3. It's very obscure why I should do these moves. Uh, probably to get the king out and just go from there, except a second pawn down for peace activity, but I choose this type of peace activity. And the reason why is that I need this counterplay absolutely. In fact, actually we're equal in this position. Wow, I took this pawn, that's right, we're equal in this position. Anyways, rook f1 and I'm threatening rook f7 check, winning this pawn, right? So the black pieces take on c3, I do check first and a little in between move, king d6 and I take back on c3. Black have done a wonderful job of weakening my pawn structure. My pawns are isolated, doubled, and another isolated pawn on a2, and they're gonna be attacked. And let me tell you, I do not wanna come back here to defend because it's gonna make my rook passive. In the end game, you want your rook as active as possible, and to stop past pawns, you want the rook behind the pawn structure. So my rook is pretty well placed for now, given the fact that if the pawn gets passed, I will have a rook on e7 to stop this pawn. Let's say this pawn doesn't exist here. So rook c8, and now we just trade off pawns. Trading off pawns is good for me. The more we trade off, the closer it is to an equal pawn and rook endgame to which I'm closest to a draw. Rook c6 to defend a6. I guess it's the heart of this pawn structure, I would do the same. If black takes here, I take with check, which is a little bit annoying, which explains further this move. And now I go for my advantage. My advantage is these two pass pawns. Go on your advantage in the end game. That's what I 100% recommend. And I'm going for it. My, my two lanes are open here, and I'm going for these pass pawns. So e4, though this pawn is more advanced, so I have to anticipate it first. King g1. King e5, superb move by the black pieces, activating the, their king. Another thematical term in this endgame. Really, the king on e5, just getting there, progressing with this pawn, is the greatest gift that the black pieces can do for themselves. And here I have to react, 
and they react very poorly. In this position, I have half my opponent's time, even though even less than, than half. It's really bad. And I played king f2, giving a pawn with check. It hurts so much. It hurts so much. King g3, and now e3. I really don't know, you guys, why they didn't just take on a2 defending a6. This is completely winning looking. Actually, I do have some aggressive things coming here. But e3? Really? e3? e3 just doesn't do it for me because I take here on a6. Oh, they really like king f2. Oh, this is a mistake. Right. This is actually a mistake, taking this pawn the greed here. We talked about this. Because black has a win. Black the plane win in this position. Pause the video to solve the problem. It is rook f2. An ingenious move. Ingenious idea. If black would have played this, that would have been, you know, you know what? GG's. Go home. And, uh, you know, I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be upset, but, you know, it's well deserved. Rook f2 has the goal to anticipate whatever I have going here, taking another pawn, they don't care. Rook f6, and the idea here that black accomplished is they have now cut out my king from stopping this pawn whatsoever. And that's very beneficial to the black pieces because they know that I cannot defend this e3 pawn that's about to queen just with my rook. I would have to give up my rook. And so here we have a little variation, rook b5, king d4, rook b4 check, king c3, and already here it's looking abandoned. If rook e4, then king d3, ay ay ay, uh, the rook goes back, we got e2 threatening e1, rook b1, king d2, and here black are gonna queen. It's completely over, super, super winning. It's a hard idea to spot, but it's really, really interesting to see the value of disconnecting my king to that pawn on e3. Anyways, I took on a6 defending my pawn on a2. I thought I was saved because a move before that, it didn't look so good. e2 now, and here, this is what I thought my opponent was gonna do, so it's better that they did it, because I played king f2, and now we're stopping this pawn completely. And this is completely drawn at this point in the game. Though there is still a surprise at the end, I promise. Okay. Here there's e1 check, very nice technique to take this valuable g pawn. And now I have two pawns on the extremities of the board while black has these two pawns here. My goal here is to trade off black's b5 pawn for my a2 pawn so I can get this outside pawn against this e6 pawn and this would be a handy draw. And this is pretty much what happens in the game. I go rook a5, king e4, king f1. What I want to do here is I want to just take the rook off of cutting my king from the first rank and I do try to accomplish that. Here we trade pawns, very important. And now my goal with this h4 pawn to secure the draw here is to make it dangerous enough that it needs the attention of either the rook or the king so that my king can swoop in and stop this e6 pawn before it's too dangerous. So I go h5, Rook h2, it's already defended here, and now I play this nice move, king g1. What I'm doing here is I'm giving black a choice. Either they have to keep defending this h6 play that's coming up with a rook h3 or rook h4, letting my king get out of the first rank, or they have to keep my king sealed on this first rank, but then letting me play h6. They keep my king sealed. <laughs> and I play h6, you know what? Go, go, go to c7, you know, go away. And so the, the rook already has to go away. I think a good move here is rook h5 now that I think about it. But I absolutely wanted to get, get my king off the first rank, so I do. Get your king active. e5, king g3. Rook c6 attacking my pawn, and here I go h7. My idea here is that if you go rook h6, I'll go rook b4 check, king moves, and now rook h4, and I'm winning. So black found the very nice defense, rook g6 check, king f2, and now rook h6, and now I don't have this anymore because I'm not defending with the king. So I have rook g7, but I'm still according to plan. It's 0-0-0. Zero, zero, zero. I'm, I'm telling you, there is a surprise at the end of this. Believe me. We are defending this pawn, and we have grasped the attention of this rook here. The rook has to remain on the h-file for the rest of the game to defend this pawn promotion. And this is very helpful when you're trying to defend against what looks like a very dangerous pawn on e5. King f5, king e3, rook h3 check. King e2, king f4, and now rook f7 check. And I'm just going to try to make this pawn on e5 stop from pushing up. Rook e7, 
check, king f1, and here, look, the black king cannot advance, and that's why I play this nice rook e7 move, to kind of hinder to this pawn. You can play king f3 though, threatening mate, so I don't have time to take on e5, but I have king g1 here attacking this rook, and as we know, the rook has to stay on the h-file, they'll probably defend this, but here I can secure the immediate draw with rook takes e5, and here you cannot take because I'll just queen, and so you shall take here and draw. So my opponent decided to advance with king d4, which is the best of the choices. Here I go king g1, giving once again my king some air. The rook has to stay on this h-file, king f2, and now rook h2. We see this pattern here, king g3, rook h1, king g2. We're kind of just like playing along here. It's a complete draw, but... I have 33 seconds left on the clock. I don't know if you've realized, but that's kind of a big deal when it's a rapid game. And so switching that style from going very slowly in the opening, in the middle game, to going super quickly, like a move per second or move per two seconds in the end game. It's hard to not mess up and it's easy to mess up, if that made sense. So I'll go king f3 here again taking up that e4 square. I do not want this pawn to push. And they do. <laughs> Mistake of the game costs black the entire game. I took on e4 with check, king d5. I really don't know what was going through their mind, by the way. It just happened. They have four minutes on the clock. They're not in time trouble like me. I don't know what happened. I go back to h7 to defend this pawn. Super clutch, king d6 attacking my rook. Here I have a really nice win, king g4. I didn't see that tempo move, obviously. I played rook a7, and now the king is fleeing to a g6 to try to stop this pawn and take it for a draw. It is now black pleading for the draw here. How the turn tables. By the way, if the king reaches f6, meaning they can reach g6, this is a complete draw. But the white pieces have a win here. White to play and win in this position. And I played... I played it. King g4 attacking this rook and using this tempo to go to g5 to take up f6. And now the white king has beaten the black king to the g6 square. Rook g1 check, king h6. If you go to f6 now, it's a queen. So you can't do that. You have to keep checking me. Now I go king g7 again, taking up that f6 square and threatening this queen's check on the king and here, oh my god, okay. To be fair to myself, I have 23 seconds, I'm panicking, probably in ecstasy of joy. I play king h8 here, and it's a complete blunder, it's a complete draw. Why? Because I let go of the critical aspect of this endgame, I gave the f6 square. And once that's done, the black king is either going to be on f7, f8, or f6, all of which are drawing moves, preventing my king from going outside of this little... I don't know, this little hiding spot? <laughs> don't know what to call this. And so here it's a complete draw, just to give you some, some, uh, you know, some insight into this. It's, it's absolutely draw. And this is what I did in the game. 16 seconds left on my clock, rook g2, king f7, and I'm telling you, I cannot get my king out of h8. I can never get my pawn to queen here. And after a couple moves, I just decide, you know what, we're going for the draw. Little cheeky rook f4 to draw this. If they take it to stalemate, still a draw. They play rook f7, last move of the game. I could have uh, played like rook f6 here to force them to take my rook. That would have been nice. Instead, I just took with 4.3 seconds on the clock. I drew an IM in a rapid game. It, it's a pretty big achievement. In a rapid game, the IM has much more time to make quality moves. It's not like beating an IM in Blitz, which I've done many times. This felt more like a quality game. And although they made a human mistake back here, you know, it is what it is. What I should have done in the end game to win would have been to go King F8. I'm sure you guessed it. King F8 is absolutely winning. And here, if you go Rook H1 to try to stop, I have king g8, and there's a difference now. On rook g1, I have rook g7 completely blockading this check anymore, and you cannot stop h8 queen. But we'll take it, you know? It's, overall, I scored a 90 in a game that had a kind of a shaky opening. So, yeah, the middle game was also, I was down a pawn, my sacrifice didn't really work there. 
but I, I grabbed the initiative and, and I played through. And after 73 moves, ladies and gentlemen, we got a draw against an IM. Thank you so much for watching the Chess Nerd Live. I hope you found this, this video instructive and entertaining and good. <laughs> have an amazing day. I hope you, you really have an amazing day uh, and, and see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Zach and see you next time.